and we're connecting with Padres beat reporter for MLB, AJ Casavell, for the first time on this show. AJ, good to see you, dude. Very timely. We, we've wanted to have you on for a bit, and this is actually the perfect day for it because we need help here. The Padres could completely swing around the trade deadline if they suddenly decide to sell and say we're going to be top dog and we're going to get a ton for Snell and Hater and we're going to rebuild. Where are we at as of right now? I, I wish I had better answers for you because it's it's been about for a month now where we kind of weren't sure which direction they'd go, whether it was buying, whether it was selling. He kind of wanted them to, wanted the team's performance to put them in one direction or another. And they have. I mean, they, they lost three or four in Philadelphia and it looked like the season was kind of on the brink and they were going towards seller. And then they finished that road trip strong and then they come back home and they lose two or three to the, to the Pirates. So I think as things stand, there's a possibility for both. There's a possibility the Padres buy and sell. And if they take the avenue of selling and maybe last night's White Sox Angels trade kind of is sets the market for what you can get for a starter and a reliever. It's a seller's market, and the Padres have two of the most intriguing chips. So I would expect with this team, nothing happens imminently. The Padres get as much data as they can on what they have. Maybe wait till after a weekend series against Texas. But if I'm if I'm looking at the needle where it stands on the buy-sell scale, I think ever so slightly it's tilted towards sell. So my question would be is, all right, they do sell. Snell, Hater, they, all of a sudden, all right, they're out there to get taken. What are they trying to get back? Uh, have you heard any inkling on that? Is there some? Is there anything like really specific that they're like, you know what? We're willing to give this up, but what are we? What are you trying to get back? Is it a boatload? Is it just certain person they're looking for? Talk to me. It's it's a they're, they're going to want a lot back because th those two guys are obviously key pieces to 2023, and they haven't given up on 2023. I think the key for what they want back is guys who can help them win either this season or very shortly, because they're going to enter 2024 regardless of how the 23 season finishes with championship aspirations. It's Juan Soto's final season before free agency. You have Manny Machado and Xander Bogart still in their primes. You got a pitching staff anchored by Joe Musgrove and you Darvish. Like this is a team that should contend next year. It should be contending this year, but that's its own story. So I think they're going to want to get pieces that help fill out their bench that are controllable. Maybe I, I think I mentioned the possibility that they both buy and sell. I think that's, a, a real possibility that they were to, if they were to trade someone like Josh Hader, they get back two or three kind of big league caliber guys to, to help their bench depth or some of maybe their outfield depth and maybe a prospect or two. And then you turn around and, and acquire a, a relief pitcher who has more control beyond this season. I think that's possible. So I think the biggest thing is in the, in, in the, what the Padres are searching for are guys that can still help them either now or very shortly because they're, they, they still think their windows open. It's just, it's just not pretty in the standings right now. All right. You said intriguing pieces in the trade market. Wouldn't you say they're the two best pieces? If they're offering Blake Snell and Josh Hader, are they not the two best pieces available right now? I think they are. I mean, as it looks like Shohei Otani's not. And so those are those are probably the two best guys. Blake Snell's been, been awesome. I think he's been – I mean, it, it was kind of a travesty that he wasn't an all-star in his hometown – He's been maybe the best pitcher in baseball for almost two and a half months now. Every time he goes out there, when he's bad, it's six innings, one run, a whole bunch of walks. When he's good, it's seven shutout innings. You put that guy in, in your rotation, he can start game one of a playoff series with how well he's pitching right now. So the Padres could get a lot for that, for, for Blake Snell. Same goes for Josh Hader. He's been locked down at the back end of that bullpen. And and it's, it, I mean, if the Padres were to look to trade those guys, I think they would still say they want to compete in 2023, and they have a lot of talent there to do so. But those guys have been so valuable for what they're trying to accomplish this season that like, any team that gets them will instantly have two guys who, who are good pieces for the rest of the regular season, no doubt. But Blake Snell could be a game one or two starter. Josh Hader could, could save big games in the postseason. Like, those are October pieces. Okay. Just help me to understand this. Help me to understand this. The Padres are willing to sell, which I don't think they should personally. I think they should go out there because I think they have a really good team personally. But the Angels are going after it. They're, like, they're trying to make it to the playoffs and hopefully win a World Series. I'm kind of confused on that entire situation. Can you help me understand that? Because I, I feel that the Padres are the better team by far, even though it's not showing in the standings. But help me understand that situation. Why 
why should the Padres be selling and the Angels shouldn't? Maybe the Padres don't sell. I mean, they, there's a case to be made that they should absolutely buy because mm-hmm. you look at kind of where they are in the standings. I don't I don't know what we would make the, the playoff odds right now for, for the Padres, but I think it's like a one in three shot at the playoffs. But if the Padres make the playoffs, like with the roster they have, with Blake Snell, with Josh Hader, like that's a team that could do damage in October. And so maybe you look at buying. I think the argument to selling is just that this team that that on paper looks like it should be so much better than it is, and I think the Angels even are four or five games better than what the Padres are right now. Like the Padres just haven't lived up to that team all season, so they haven't shown the signs of, of being that team. I think in an ideal world, they'd like another like two or three weeks to kind of see if they can attain that, but they just haven't. Something so far this season has been missing. What that thing is, I'm ha- I watch them every day. I have a hard time putting my finger on it because they, I mean, their run differential so good they just lose every close game it seems like and so i mean if the padres were to if the padres were to buy at the trade deadline and add a they wouldn't have to sacrifice too much to add a a, a dh type bat and maybe a, a middle innings reliever that's a team that could go on a run and make the playoffs i think you just look at the odds and you say it's more likely than not that they don't so do you sell as a result of that and then what happens i think you also don't want to you don't want to. You don't want to take what you have here, which is a lot of really good players, and kind of upset what's going on. Mm-hmm. This is a team that should be a contender in twenty twenty four, regardless of what happens. I I just don't know what they're going to do over the next four days, and whether they look to that as the goal, or whether they still keep their focus right now in this season, even with the odds dwindling. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go back to what you're saying here because I've watched a lot of Padres, and hey, I've done well on on my bets that I've placed this year. But I did say for our preseason predictions. I love the Padres. I think they're going to win the World Series. It's not looking good right now. Now, at some point, I was like, oh, this could be like the Phillies last year where the team underperforms for a while. And then all of a sudden, they go on a run and then they get hot at the right time and they make that run through the playoffs. Still possible. Not a lot of time left and no chance in my mind, obviously, if Snell and or Hater are dealt. So I'll kind of finish that statement with a question of just what the fuck? Like, why are all of those close games not going their way? Now, is it bullpen to blame? Is it the offense for not blowing teams out at times when it feels like they should? And also, this series tells it all. You're watching them play a Pirates team that is just flat out not good. And the Pirates are, they're making the Pirates look like a playoff team. Yeah, and that. I, I don't have the answer to to that the close game question, but I keep writing it and I keep talking about it because that's the biggest issue. This is a team that's a lot better than what the record says it is, just based on the talent they have. Their differential is plus fifty one. I think they're that that's the third best in the National League, and their record is the tenth best. I think they're six and seventeen in one run games, zero and nine in extra innings. It's some of it's the bullpen getting overworked at certain times. Some of it's not situational hitting. I think some of it is games like yesterday where you kind of have Johan Oviedo on the ropes early and they let him off the hook and all of a sudden it gets to the seventh, eighth inning and you're like, man, where where is this game headed? Like how, how are the Padres not up by three or four runs already? And then you get to the ninth inning and all of a sudden there's pressing. There's, there's a lot of like weirdness to it. I think some of it might be luck, which is part of the reason I think that you take this roster and you run it back in 2024 with, with, Whatever else you do, like there's a good chance they could be a contender then. But I I just don't know what's been lacking from this group other than results in those close games. And so it's it, it it's hard to it's hard to figure out. They're they're so much better than than what their record indicates based on the talent they have, but they just haven't played like it. This is rumor season. You're in the clubhouse all the time. We've heard rumors about the clubhouse having an issue. Somebody being in the clubhouse that is not, you know, is the clubhouse together? And, you know, take away the losing part of it because every, everyone hates life when they're losing. But is there a clubhouse thing that you see that's going on in there? I don't I don't really think so. I think it's a pissed off team that's losing a bunch of games. And that's that's the clubhouse that I that I go into after after games. I don't think there's like discord among the players. I think there, there's plenty of unity there. But Losing greats on you and losing in, in, in this sport, probably, I mean, you guys know better than me, like losing in this sport where it's where every single day you're kind of not living up to those expectations is different than, than any other. And so being in a clubhouse day in, day out, when you're not living up to those expectations, I think it maybe feels a little bit like every time the Padres, every time the Padres win a game, 
maybe it's kind of what everyone in that clubhouse feels like they should be doing. So you don't appreciate it as much. You don't revel in it as much. And when you lose a game and you're four games under 500 already and you lose to the Pirates on a Wednesday afternoon in July, knowing where you are at the trade deadline, it, it starts to feel like a crisis. And I think that builds and compounds and frustrations grow. And so I, I don't know about specific discord, but I don't think it's a happy clubhouse. Per se. All right. I got a fan question for you here from Brian. He asks, why did Padres extend players they didn't have to, like a Darvish and a Cronworth? What would you answer to that? Well, they're kind of two separate cases. Darvish was going to be a free agent after this season, and they looked at their rotation beyond this season and essentially felt that that having you, Darvish, beyond this year was going to be probably more important than... Like, they locked him up at a relatively reasonable average annual value. He has kind of been up and down this season. I still think you, Darvish, is going to be really good late, into, late, late into his career. The Cronenworth one, I think, is a little kind of different question because they had so much team control left on him, and... I, I just think they really like the guy and they like the piece and they like the fit in the clubhouse. And uh, it, I mean, his AAV is also pretty low, but that's one where you, you kind of you see it and you're like, well, they could have, it had they waited to negotiate, maybe things would have been a little different there. Um, it's, it's kind of also the, the organizational preference, the ownership preference to find guys that they, they want to build around and keep them here long-term. I mean, I don't know whether that – we'll kind of see what happens later in those contracts. I'm sure both of them at, toward the end of them won't look great. But there are two integral pieces that I think – in Darvish's case, he's been mostly fine this season. He had a couple a couple starts that have that have kind of blown up his ERA. Um, in Cronenworth's case, he's just he just hasn't lived up to what, what the Padres expected him to be till now. All right. Your crystal ball time. We don't think – we don't know what the Padres are. This year, I mean, next year at this time, the Padres are the exact same. How are the Padres going to handle Juan Soto differently than the Angels are handling Otani? So you're saying the Padres are the exact same or in as the they same are spot as they are? I think if they're in the same spot they are this year, then something's gone terribly wrong next year because this this team, as constructed, can't do can't possibly do this two years in a row, right? So <laughs> I, I think if if it got to that point the Padres would have to consider trading Juan Soto and recouping some of that value. But I just think they're going to go into that season. Like the re there's a reason Juan Soto hasn't been mentioned in any trade discussions this year. It's because the Padres look at 2024 and say, you know what, this, if, even if what they end up saying is 2023, probably not going to happen. And they trade hater or they trade Snell or they trade them both. They still look at 2024 as a season where they can win. They can accomplish big things. And so if they're in the same spot next season, I think they would have to entertain so the trading Soto. I just don't think they have any plans to do so because they really, really want to take this franchise where it hasn't been before, which is winning a World Series. Okay, let's finish with this. Where's A.J. Preller at? I mean, obviously, he's going to at least run this team through next year if this team doesn't do what it's expected to do. At some point, he's been with the ball club for a while. Do you think that he's going to feel his seat getting hot? I know and we have a ton of respect. I mean, we we talk about owners on this show all the time. Peter Seidler has, has gone for it, picking up superstars, putting money into the team. The place is filled up. And I've been out there. It's freaking awesome. Like most, We wish most owners would be like Peter Seidler. He sets the great example. And he sounds like he's a loyal guy too. Do you think there's disappointment in the front office just for not being still like a consistent winner in playoff team despite all of this? Like the formula isn't connecting, which sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's like, there's such a complicated kind of look at what AJ Preller has done in his tenure with the Padres because he's brought in so many big time players and big time pieces and he's done so with the backing of ownership. And then there's just kind of questions about how he's filled out the fringes of his roster. Some of which are out of his control. Some of which are completely within his control. I think the Padres one through 10, their 10 best players are better than any top 10 players on any roster in baseball. And so you kind of wonder, well, what's what's maybe going on with those 11 through 40 that the Padres aren't living up to those expectations, that their bench is as thin as it is where when the season's on the line, you've got some of the career minor league pieces that you have batting in the ninth inning of a big game against the Pirates. So I, I think there's there's probably, like, the organization, Peter Seidler, 
he, what he's done for San Diego has been outstanding. The ballpark's packed every single night. And the leeway he's given A.J. Preller to kind of go and acquire these superstars and then pay these superstars is, I mean, it, it's extremely notable. I think A.J. Preller probably, I, I don't know what happens the rest of this season, but he would probably be given the foresight to go ahead and see what happens in 2024, too, with him at the helm. It'll be, if if the Padres, I mean, we're getting really ahead of ourselves here because Preller has a very big next five days first, but if if the Padres don't realize their goals and aspirations this season, I think Preller, based on what's happened now in two of the last three seasons, 2023 was, or 2022 was kind of magical in San Diego. They beat the Dodgers. They they signed one, or they traded for Juan Soto. But I think if you go into this offseason with two out of three seasons ending in disappointment when the Padres have pushed more of their chips in than they had in the past, then Preller's seat will be hot going into 2024. I appreciate you coming on here, man. I know you're a Jersey guy like myself. I'm going to send you out a fresh pie because I know you're not eating good pizza over there. So be on the lookout. <laughs> it's it's decent. There's no such thing as bad pizza, but nothing like Jersey pizza. All right. I respect that, man. Thanks again for coming out. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, AJ. Great to talk to you, dude. AJ Casavell and. <laughs>